Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the transduction of painful stimuli. Okay, right. So, in this video, what we now want to do is continue our discussion of the detection of noxious heat. Okay, so detecting that the environment is too hot and activating nociceptors because of that. And we're going to discuss a potassium channel called the KCNK. Two, okay, which is basically a leaky potassium channel which is usually open but upon uh, putting it in a too high temperature environment will close and this is going to lead to a net uh, positive depolarizing current going into the axon terminal of the receptor. So to understand how this is going to work I need to explain to you uh, the way that resting membrane potential is built up. So, let's start by discussing resting membrane potential. How do you get an electrical potential difference across the cell membrane of negative 65 millivolts? What is resting membrane potential? So the starting point for all of this is the concentration gradients of the sodium and potassium ions across the cell membrane. Okay, so let's start off with the concentration gradient for the sodium ion. So for sodium, we have a concentration extracellularly of around 145 millimolar, whilst the concentration intracellularly is around 12 millimolar. Meanwhile, for potassium, the concentration extracellularly is around 4 millimolar, whilst the concentration intracellularly is around 155 millimolar. Okay, so those are our concentration gradients, and that's the starting point for the building up of a, a resting membrane potential. Now what you need is a membrane that is permeable to sodium and potassium ions. So what we need is some leaky sodium channels, and these are just sodium channels that are always open. Okay, so here is a leaky sodium channel, so it's usually open. Okay, so I have this in red here. Okay, and then we also have leaky potassium channels, of which KCNK2 is an example of one of these leaky, constitutively open uh, potassium channels. Okay, so let's have this coloured in in blue here. Right, okay, now what can happen? Well, basically, sodium ions can move through the sodium channel into the cell, and potassium ions can move out of the cell through the potassium ion channel. Okay. At the moment, we're assuming that the, is, there is no electrical potential difference between the extracellular compartment and the intracellular compartment, i.e. that the electrical potential extracellularly is the same as the electrical potential intracellularly. So we're assuming we're starting off with a neutral electrical potential difference across the cell. So now, all that we have to think about with regards to which direction is sodium going to move and which direction are we going to get a net movement of potassium ions is the concentration gradient. So the concentration gradient of sodium is around 12-fold favouring the movement inwards, simply because the probability that a sodium ion will hit from the outside and go in is 12 times greater than the probability that a sodium ion will hit from the inside and go out. Okay, so we're going to get a net movement of sodium into the cell. For potassium, um, the concentration gradient is around 40-fold, and that favours the movement of potassium out of the cell. So we're going to get a net movement of potassium ions out of the cell. Now, which of these is greater, basically? Well, firstly, we've got a bigger concentration gradient for potassium. We've got a 40-fold concentration gradient. So you would expect the net movement of potassium out of the cell to beat the net movement of sodium into the cell. Okay. In addition, the permeability of the cell membrane to potassium, the so-called PK+, plus, is greater than the permeability of the cell membrane to sodium. Now, what does that mean? It means that the ease with which a potassium ion can move across the cell membrane is greater than the ease at which a sodium ion can move across the cell membrane. Now, that might be because there are more leaky potassium channels than there are leaky sodium channels. I've just drawn one leaky potassium channel and one leaky sodium channel. If there were more leaky potassium channels than leaky sodium channels, then, of course, even if the concentration 
oxidation gradients were exactly the same, you'd expect a greater movement of potassium because there are a greater number of channels. So the permeability is basically a measure of how many channels there are, how easy it is for an ion to actually get through this channel. All of that is taken into account in this permeability. And at the moment, it's easier for a potassium ion to cross the membrane than it is for a sodium ion to cross the membrane. Okay, right. So, the fact that the concentration gradient is bigger and the fact that the permeability is bigger as well is going to mean that overall we're going to get a net movement of potassium ions out, which is greater than the net movement of sodium ions in. Now, let me stress something. All of these ions, these sodium ions and these potassium ions, they had counter ions, okay? Usually chloride anions. So you don't just have a positively charged solution in the cell and outside of the cell. All of these ions that we're talking about dissolved here, the sodium ions and the potassium ions, originally they were put in in some ionic salt. So for instance, sodium chloride would have been added. And then when they went into solution, they parted apart. The sodium ion and the chloride anion parted apart. So basically, the chloride anions that were associated with these sodium and potassium ions, they cannot move across the membrane. They can't get through these channels. These channels only allow the movement of the sodium ions and the potassium ions. Okay, so what's going to happen? is we're going to get a net movement of potassium out, which is greater than the movement of sodium in. Now that means that the amount of positive charge you are moving out of the cell in the form of potassium ions is going to be greater than the amount of positive charge you are bringing into the cell in the form of sodium ions. So both of them carry a single positive charge. So overall, you're going to be moving positive charge into the extracellular compartment and out of the intracellular compartment. Okay, now what does that mean for the electrical potentials? That means that the electrical potential extracellularly will go up, whilst the electrical potential intracellularly will go down. The extracellular electrical potential goes up because we're moving a net amount of positive charge into the extracellular fluid, whereas the intracellular electrical potential is going to go down because we're moving positive charge out of the intracellular compartment. That means that when we ask what is the electrical potential difference from extracellular to intracellular, the number is going to start becoming negative because we're asking how much will you change if you go from here to here. This number is now bigger than this number. This number's gone positive. This number's gone negative, if you like. Okay? Uh, well, we're saying that we didn't know what the absolute values of each of them was originally. Okay? We just knew that they were the same originally. Um, we're raising this one, decreasing this one. So if we ask how much will you change if you go from extracellular to intracellular, which is the electrical potential intracellularly minus the electrical potential extracellularly, this number is now going to become negative. Okay? So you're going to start getting a negative electrical potential difference across the cell membrane. Brain. Now, originally, this might be something tiny. So let's imagine, originally, we've got to a point where it's t negative 10 millivolts. Okay, but what does this mean now? We now have a lower electrical potential intracellularly than extracellularly. So we now do have an electrical potential gradient across the cell membrane. The Potassium and the sodium ions are both positively charged ions, so they want to be where the electrical potential is lower, which is now the intracellular electrical, um, sorry, the intracellular compartment. So basically, the fact that the electrical gradient now favors the movement of sodium and potassium inwards is going to increase the size of the movement of sodium in. So this will become bigger and it's going to decrease the size of the movement of potassium out. Okay, now when we're only at negative 10 millivolts, it won't have increased the movement of sodium in enough yet that it is bigger than the movement of sodium out. So I haven't quite um, drawn this the way I would have liked to because I would have liked it that the arrows represented the movement out. So really it would have been something like this. You originally have a small movement of sodium in when they were the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane was zero, okay? And now, at negative 10 millivolts, what it's going to change to 
is a slightly bigger arrow in in the form of sodium and a slightly smaller movement of potassium out. Okay, so they're getting closer to being equal. Now, of course, when it we've just got to this, okay, so let's say we've only got to an electrical potential difference across the cell membrane of negative 10 millivolts, then you're still getting a net movement of positive charge out of the cell because the number of potassium ions that you're moving out still beats the number of sodium ions that you're bringing in. Okay, so you've still got overall a net movement of positive charge from the intracellular compartment into the extracellular compartment. Okay, so that means that you're going to make the electrical potential difference even more negative because the electrical potential extracellularly will continue to go up and the electrical potential intracellularly will continue to drop down. This will continue happening until you get to around negative 65 millivolts. Now at negative 65 millivolts, the movement of potassium out will have been reduced to a size now where it's equal to the amount that you've increased the movement of sodium in. So remember, the fact that we are making a negative electrical potential difference, we're making the intracellular compartment more negative than the extracellular uh, electrical potential. Uh, basically, what that means is that we're going to increase the movement of sodium in and decrease the movement of potassium out. The resting membrane potential is then when you've got a correct voltage across the cell membrane that the movement of sodium in is exactly matching the movement of potassium out. Okay, so this is sodium in and this is potassium out. And then there is no net movement of electrical charge across the cell membrane because the movement in in the form of sodium is the same as the movement out in the form of potassium. And then we have an equilibrium. Okay, so this will be called equilibrium potential or resting potential. Okay, right. So that is what resting membrane potential is all about. It's this point where the movement of potassium ions out of the cell through the leaky potassium channels is equal to the movement of sodium ions into the cell uh, through the leaky sodium channels. And therefore, there is no net movement of charge across the cell membrane. And therefore, the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane does not change. Okay, that's the important thing. Now, you might say, well, this doesn't look much like an equilibrium to me because you're continuously moving sodium ions in and potassium ions out. So eventually, you're going to diminish the concentration gradient across the cell membrane. Well, that's true. And that's the reason you have a protein in the cell membrane called the sodium-potassium pump. Okay, so this is the sodium potassium. And rather than pump, the slightly better term is ATPase. And basically, this is a pump, or an ATPase, which uses ATP hydrolysis to provide the energy for the transportation of sodium ions out of the cell and potassium ions into the cell. Okay, so this will move uh, three sodium ions out, okay, for two potassium ions in. Okay, so it just returns the uh, concentration gradients. It moves the sodium that is coming in all the time into the cell. It moves that back out, basically. So all this sodium that's continuously coming into the cell, that's going to be going back out through the sodium-potassium ATPase. And all the potassium that we're continuously losing from the cell will be being brought back in by the sodium-potassium ATPase. Okay. Now, uh, the sodium-potassium ATPase, therefore, its job is not to create the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane. Its job is to uh, maintain the concentration gradients of ions across the cell membrane, even in the face of this uh, equilibrium that's occurring here, where we've got an equilibrium as far as the movement of charge is concerned, but not with regards to the movement of ions as a whole. Okay, so it's job is to reverse the movement of ions rather than maintain the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane. Right. Okay, so that's resting membrane potential then. Now what we can discuss is why the KCNK2 channel, which is a leaky potassium channel, which is also sensitive to temperature, okay, why this thing closing in, respond to, in response to high temperatures is going to trigger 
a depolarization of the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane of that axon terminal and therefore is going to lead to a receptor potential which then activates an action potential at the action potential origin of that uh, nociceptor. Okay, so basically what we're now going to do is normally this KCNK2 channel will be one of these leaky potassium channels, okay? But in the presence of high temperature, these will close, okay? So they close in the presence of too high temperature, okay? So this is high temperature. So they are a, a noxious uh, heat uh, noci sensor, okay? So why is that going to trigger depolarization of the electrical potential difference? Well, we are now going to reduce the movement of potassium ions out. So suddenly this channel is going to close. Okay, now of course there are other leaky potassium channels. So you're not closing all of them, but you are closing, you know, a fraction of them. So you're closing some of your leaky potassium channels, the potassium channels which are of this form. And I should stress that, I'm going to stress this again, not all of the leaky potassium channels you have are KCNK2. There are a vast plethora of different leaky potassium channels. This is one of them. Okay, so in the membrane you'll have leaky potassium channel after leaky potassium channel after leaky potassium channel. Okay, so let me imagine this is your membrane that you're looking at from above. You've got loads of these things all over the place and they're all usually open. Now if you close a fraction of these, which are the KCNK2 channels. So let's say that one was a KCNK2, that one was a KCNK2, that one was a KCNK2. Then you are going to reduce the net movement of potassium out of the cell through these leaky potassium channels. Now at equilibrium, the movement of potassium out of the cell through the leaky potassium channels is equal to the movement of sodium into the cell through the leaky sodium channels. You have not changed the activity of the leaky sodium channels shown here in red. Those are all still fine. So that means that you've reduced the current of potassium out without changing the movement of sodium in. So you've distorted this equilibrium. You've made this arrow smaller, if you like. You've cut it off there and you've made it smaller. Okay, so it's been reduced to this, but you haven't changed this movement of sodium in. So now you're actually going to get a net movement of positive charge into the cell because the sodium ion current in is going to be greater than the potassium ion current out. Okay, and that's going to trigger uh, you to have a net movement of positive charge into the cell. Okay, and what that's going to do is it will raise the electrical potential intracellularly and lower the electrical potential extracellularly because we're taking positive charge out of the extracellular compartment. Therefore, when we ask what's the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane going to do, well, it's going to become less negative, okay? Because originally it was negative 65 millivolts, which meant that going from here to here, we went down by 65 millivolts. But this one's now reduced, and this one's come up to meet this one. So now the number's going to be less negative, basically. So you're going to get a depolarization. And this extra bit of sodium that you're getting in to the cell, or this extra bit of positive charge, rather, I should say, because the sodium current has actually remained the same. It's just the positive charge movement has now changed. Okay, this extra bit of positive charge you've got here, this is your depolarizing current. Okay, and this will then diffuse in the intracellular fluid to uh, the action potential origin and will depolarize the membrane there, causing an action potential. Okay, so let me just repeat that. So, this is your depolarizing current here. You've now brought some net positive charge into the cell. And this net positive charge will cause a receptor potential in the axon terminal. It will cause the depolarization of the electrical potential difference across that cell membrane. But the axon terminal itself can't really fire action potentials. So the depolarizing current will diffuse off into the cytoplasm in this action potential origin region over here. Okay, and then we'll cause depolarization of the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane there, and this action potential origin uh, portion will then fire an action potential down the axon, and uh, therefore the nociceptor has become active. So there's another example of a nociceptor for uh, noxious heat.
Okay, so we'll call it there now for this video. In the next video, we'll turn our attention to nociscensors for noxious cold.